sure <laughs> that we'll have more. 50, when, when is that, David? 59. It's the 28th, 28th of, yes, of, the 28th April. of April. Sunday, the 28th of April. Are right. you coming, David? I may just uh, okay. I may do that. This, uh, and are you uh, running, Judge? I'll be there. Okay. I'll be ready. <laughs> 10K? You want to try the 10K? I'll but, you know, I, I, I have to ask this as a maybe a final question, but I know some of the viewers are, are thinking about it. We've got to protect, protect kids from all kinds of child abuse. Where do you draw the line on discipline then? You know, the, the old thing is spare the, spare the rod and spoil the child. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are uh, a thousand people out there right now who will say, you know, there's a, an occasion when my youngster deserves a good swat in the mm -hmm. rear end. So mm -hmm. where do you draw well, the line? Well, we're very careful to be certain that we, we're, we're not interfering in family development. Um, so discipline is a kind of a personal family uh, situation, a decision. But there are laws and laws that say and protect children from uh, injury by instrument. Okay, if an instrument is used, that's abuse. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I, I swat on the butter, I, you know, but that's not referred for as a, as a child abuse mm -hmm. case. But there is a line, and the line basically says that if you use an instrument for injury, you have crossed the line. So we all need to grow up as a family with respect, I would say, and... Um, and I think we know the line if we just yeah. think about and it. And obviously at least one child does who said they'd get a lawyer. So. That's <laughs> right. That's right. One child. Right. Thank you, Marianne LaPorta. I'm getting a notice that we're out of time, but it was a wonderful interview. Thank you so Thank you. much for yes. your time. And uh, David, I know it was interesting. This is the third time she's been here. <laughs> we'll have her back again. And we're going to have her back this again. This is an important subject that people yeah. must Ex be aware of. Extremely important yeah. subject. Marianne Laporta, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jim Lavallo, my, uh, who's watching our show, thank you. Mark McGlory, thank you so much for thank your, you, Mark. your dedication Always. to our station. You're wonderful. wonderful. David the Cosmo? Amazing. Let me shake your hand. Thank you so much. <laughs> David and I, are, we passed our three year mark, so we're oh. on our way. Looks like it may be a steady thing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> thanks a lot. This is thank Tom Munley saying thanks for watching ACTV Live, and we'll see you again next week. Hi, I'm Maureen McGuigan, Deputy Director of Arts and Culture for Lackawanna County. How many artists do you think it takes to change a light bulb? Well, I bet they'd tell you they first need to build a better light bulb. But that's the power of art. It really does transform our world. Arts and culture makes communities more vibrant. And we're lucky here in Lackawanna County that our county commissioners, Jim Wansack, Corey B. O'Brien, and Patrick M. O'Malley, are committed to supporting an arts and culture department which ensures that all of our residents have access to the arts, and many times for free. But now we'd like to hear your ideas for arts and culture. So our Arts, Culture, and Education Event Planning Committee is inviting you to the first workshop of their 2013 series. It's a What's the Big Idea party to be held on Tuesday, April 23rd, Shakespeare's birthday, from 5.30 to 8 p.m. in the Platform Lounge at the Radisson Hotel in downtown Scranton. It's a free event. It'll feature appetizers, a cash bar, and local actor Connor McGuigan will MC to help things moving along. You just need to bring your ideas. You don't need to register, and you don't need to be an official artist. We want anyone that has an idea to come join us. If you have questions, please feel free to call me at the office at 570-963-6590, extension 102, or you can email us at arts-culture at lackawannacounty.org. So put your thinking cap on, because we hope to see you on April 23rd.
I call this public caucus to order. The purpose of this meeting is to discuss ways in which our state legislators may be able to assist the city of Scranton with its critical financial struggles as it enters its 21st year of distressed status under the myriad failures of Act 47. Further, the Council of the City of Scranton invited our guests to this caucus in response to the requests of the Scranton Lackawanna Taxpayers Association and other city residents who wish to hear from their state officials. In attendance this evening are Pennsylvania State Senator John Blake, Pennsylvania State Representative Kevin Haggerty, and Mr. Tom Welby, legislative aide to State Representative Martin Flynn. Representative Flynn is unable to participate since he is conducting hearings on privatization of state-run liquor sales. Welcome to Scranton City Council cha uh, Chambers, gentlemen, although, Mr. Welby, you're certainly no stranger. <laughs> As some are aware, Senator Blake and I have met several times in the last two years to discuss the financial state of Scranton as well as potential remedies, some of which achieved our mutual agreement, such as the Senator's firm advocacy of a county sales tax, while others, like a commuter tax, met with a respectful divergence of opinion. I have since read of State Senate assistance that may be provided to strengthen nonprofits' tax exemptions through legislation and to determine methods to alleviate the burdens of financially strapped and or distressed third-class municipalities, neither of which addresses the demonstrated needs of Scranton. However, I have confidence that Senator Blake will do his best to include Scranton among the distressed third-class cities targeted for potential assistance. Further, while Scranton struggled against bankruptcy, Lackawanna County gained state approval for an increase in its hotel tax fairly quickly. Of course, I recognize that both representatives Haggerty and Flynn are freshman legislators, and as such, were not participants in the county hotel tax increase. They've enjoyed but a brief time in which to make their marks in the House of Representatives. How, although we do await those acts with great faith and hope. In addition, I commend Representative Haggerty for his reintroduction of two House bills into the House Urban Affairs Committee, which would provide for the purchase of military time toward retirement for our public safety employees. Gentlemen, we recognize that you serve and represent not only Scranton residents, but also constituents in areas outside of our city. While Scranton shares the financial hardships of many third-class municipalities statewide, there are facts and circumstances that are unique to Scranton alone and are not a burden to our neighbors and your other constituents. Like so many others, our city is comprised primarily of hard-working blue-collar families and senior citizens who struggle to survive on fixed incomes. However, nearly 25% of our population live at or below the poverty level. More than 30% of city properties are owned by nonprofits, and Scranton's unemployment rate together with those of Wilkes-Barre and Hazleton, has remained the highest in our Commonwealth for 35 consecutive months. In 2011, the State Supreme Court ruled against Act 47 and the City of Scranton in favor of Act 111 and Scranton Public Safety Unions, awarding upwards of $30 million to police and fire. This decision was the climax of a 10-year battle. Senator Blake, uh, you were formerly employed by the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, is that correct? Yes, it is, madam. And during what years were you employed by this department? Uh, 07 to 10. Now, 
You may recall that Mayor Doherty had stated to the press and media that the state, that is DCED, would not allow him to approve the contract that was negotiated between the city and its public safety unions in October 2008. Therefore, it appears that Scranton was used as the test case, or guinea pig, by the State Department of Community and Economic Development in its battle for supremacy between Act 47 and Act 111, particularly since a DCED attorney, Clifford Levine, presented the city of Scranton's case before the state Supreme Court. Senator Blake, were our mayor's statements accurate? Well, Madam, I would tell you that I, I, I don't have what I would call first-hand knowledge of the legal assessment in order to give you what I think would be an appropriate legal response to your question. I would tell you, however, uh, that we felt that the Supreme Court ruling was wrong. I would tell you that the dissent in that ruling uh, by the Supreme Court Chief Justice Castile seem to resonate more properly for DCED's position, and so here we are. Um, I, I would tell you this. I believe that the interpretation that for years was held by both the city, its governing body, including the mayor and council, as well as the city, of, as well as DCED, which took, took you ultimately to that court case, was well-founded, was proper, was justified, was substantiated, and it is, again, a regret that I have to sit here publicly and tell you of my, my basically, my surprise at the, end, at the end game here, at the Supreme Court ruling, and because I really believed it, uh, it undermined an argument that had stood, withstood the test of legal time up to that point. So, and, and certainly yeah. the results are going to be helpful to other municipalities, but it, it serves Scranton well in no way. But I, I guess I was, again, looking for a response in terms of, was it just a city government decision to um, set aside that contract that was negotiated in 2011, which incidentally would have cost this city and its taxpayers less than half of what has occurred via the Supreme Court award, mm -hmm. or whether if, as the mayor says, it was through your office's um, push and drive that that contract was set aside and the uh, path to the Supreme Court was forged. Well, Madam President, I can tell you this. At the end of the day, the decisions that pre prevail upon that process are the decisions that are made by the governing body of the city. If the mayor has made a representation that the, that the state insisted upon, you know, that, that it was the state's influence that, that uh, you know, that prompted or impelled uh, you to the, to, to the Supreme Court, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I can't make that judgment. My feeling about it is that it's the judgment of the, of the governing body of the city, the mayor and city council, to make the decisions to carry their case forward to court or not to. So I, I can't point the finger at the mayor and say he made that as a unilateral decision. I can't point the finger at DCED and say that they forced you to make a decision that un ultimately ended up being an unfortunate one. What I can tell you is that everything that was done was done based upon what I would call historical precedent, was based upon the legal requirements under Act 47, if that's what was driving it, uh, and I think it was. And I believe that it was the department's obligation, DCED's obligation, to guarantee that they fulfilled implementation of the law. So I'm not going to sit here and make a judgment on, on that decision making. I'm just going to say it was the governing body decision to make. Well, I can tell you that that decision was not made in any part by Scranton City Council. In fact, City Council implored the mayor to do quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, he proceeded because of DCED's insistence, according to him, and as I mentioned earlier, further evidence is the fact that DCED presented the case for the city of Scranton before the Supreme Court, not a city attorney. Um, and, and as far as, you know, a, a historical precedent, I, I don't think there ever has been any. I think we set the precedent now. Mm -hmm. We were used to set that precedent. But nevertheless, in response to these myriad mounting financial strains, 
the city did take action. Management salaries were cut, positions were eliminated, and nearly all city fees were increased. Most city pools remained closed last summer. Further, in 2012 and 2013, city property taxes increased by 27 percent, while county taxes climbed by 52 percent. Our wage tax remains so oppressively steep, it serves as a deterrent to new business and industry. At least 17 million is owed to city police and fire within two months to satisfy the Supreme Court award, and municipal pensions are underfunded by five million in 2013. The taxpayers of Scranton are pleading for help because they cannot afford further property tax increases. They can no longer pay the fair shares of others who absolve themselves from their responsibilities. And you gentlemen are like the parents to various communities. We're all your children. One of your children is critically ill and has been kept alive through life support for the last year. You have an opportunity and I believe an obligation to try to save your child. And so I ask you, Senator Blake, Representative Haggerty, and Mr. Welby, if you would pass this along, would you support a state bailout for the city of Scranton and introduce sister legislation for such in the Senate and House? That's a very broad question. I mean, I guess the, the question would be, what is a state bailout? My, my concern, obviously, is this. I make a decision as a legislator based upon the judgment I have about what's absolutely the best for the people I represent, and I will always do that. Um, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania itself um, is dealing with not only the, stress, the financial stresses of this city, but as you said your, yourself, uh, Council President, many, many third-class cities uh, that are in deep distress, deep fiscal distress for many of the systematic and what I'd, I would call structural reasons that we all know what they are. We know it's an eroded tax base. We know it's an issue associated with tax exempt property. Uh, there are other prevailing issues associated with the state's failure to deal with uh, a standardized reassessment um, and taking that responsibility up to the state level as opposed to leaving at the county level. Um, there are economic development things that we should be doing in terms of driving investment into our cities in order to create job growth and to deal with what you said is a very stubborn unemployment rate here in northeastern Pennsylvania. So to ask me if I would support a bailout of the city of Scranton, I think, is asking me to make a decision that has that has implications far beyond this city to every other city that's looking for the same bailout. And it may be too expensive for the Commonwealth to do in mass. Now, are there things that we can do as legislators and things that we must do to guarantee that there are changes in public policies that can deal with the structural problems that, that lead to the fiscal distress of your city? Absolutely. And that's where I will be on the wall every day as the Senator for the 22nd District. There are things with respect to tactics and property, and I can speak to this. The Senate Bill 4 that came up trying to do a constitutional amendment, if you will, to deal with the issue of the Purely Public Charities Act is a function of a state Supreme Court ruling, which has now muddied the water associated with what that means for our purely public charities. My commentary and committee on this point has been we should not have our municipalities pitted against these nonprofits, but neither do we have an appropriate set of standards to guarantee that the nonprofits themselves can be assessed in the 21st century as to their obligation to the municipalities wherein they operate, nor do we have an opportunity to empower you with something to engage thoughtfully in dialogue with these nonprofits in a manner that would hold them accountable to what they might be required to be giving you, the city of Scranton, on behalf of your, of your residents. That is a problem. And in, in, the city of, in the city of Pittsburgh, for instance, the ICA, which is the Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement, has just established a task force to deal with exactly that issue with respect to tax exempt property, its implications, what, what can we do to, to foster a, what I would call a less acrimonious and less court-driven um, dialogue between our municipal governments and our nonprofits in order to come to some understanding of the burden that you have to bear vis-a-vis -vis their tax exempt status and the obligations you have to meet basic needs to your citizens. So can I do something, and I've talked to you actually in private quarters about trying to advance legislation about, about dealing with the dysfunction of Act 47. We know it's a flawed statute. You have witnessed those flaws unfortunately, to the, to the uh, detriment of the city. 
but I think there is an opportunity for us to legislate perhaps in some way that would get you past those flaws and into a better circumstance public policy-wise with respect to dealing with your fiscal distress. There's so many things that we can do. You mentioned the optional county sales tax, the issue of the ICA. We're doing things on the public-private charities that I believe will result in new legislation that will set up a new set of standards and that will deal with, I think, this impasse that we're dealing with in terms of lack of clarity. And I think we can deal with that tax-exempt issue in a better way than we have. The issue of reassessment is a critical one as well, not one that's taxpayer-friendly, mind you, because mm -hmm. this is an issue that's extraordinarily diff difficult for any, any office holder in any kind of government right now. So that's, that's an issue that we need to deal with in terms of our failure at the state level to create some opportunities for correction. I mentioned the ICA, which is something that I wouldn't mind pursuing. The issues that relate to Act 47 in particular are even being re completely reconfigured under a task force that the local government commission is empowering now. And they're bringing labor to the table in a way that they did not do years ago. Uh, so the task force that originally established at the very origin of Act 47, which was meant to be in response to the fiscal distress of our cities, um, and which led to the actual legislation that we now know as Act 47, is, is being completely revisited by a similar engagement of those stakeholders along with labor to try to rewrite that statute in a manner that can change the trajectory of your city and other cities like yours. So I, I can't answer the question that I can offer you a bailout, Madam President, because I, I don't know what that means or what it would cost and what implications it has for other cities of the state. Well, I, I don't expect that it particularly would have any implications for any other city because, as you know, we've discussed previously, Scranton is alone in its problem concerning Act 47, Act 111, and a Supreme Court case in the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. No other city had a 34-plus million dollar judgment against it. No other city took on its unions for 10 years, as was done in the city of Scranton. They stood by and watched as all of this occurred. So that there's been you know, no foul for them, no, no repercussions, and now everything is getting fixed slowly but surely. But that doesn't absolve Scranton of that debt. And what I'm looking for is assistance in paying that debt. And that has no effect on any other city because basically each of those cities have benefited from what occurred. They escaped uh, any decisions by a court system. They're not shouldered with this financial burden of payment. And uh, now, they're going to benefit through, uh, let us say, better labor relations and negotiations through hopefully an improved Act 47. But that does not solve what's happened here. And what I'm looking for, I think, are um, decisions and assurances, or lack thereof, from you gentlemen in terms of how you're going to help this city. Well, this, listen, I, I will do anything that I can to advocate for state support for the city of Scranton. I do it every day. Um, so it's not a problem for me to do that. I think you are correct in the distinctive nature of the burden that this city has had as a result of the Supreme Court ruling. I, I don't dispute that point. You make a, an appropriate argument. The question, and, and, and by the way, you know, the city did try to assist you, or the state did try to assist you in the midst of the crisis that we came through. There were at least $3 million that I can recall that were put on the table that, were, that was distinctive. That was, and you know, the administration came forward and did actually provide some support to the city, albeit not enough, but at least it provided some support that I think was distinctive and that was unique and in, in that they realized the depth of the crisis. It's certainly not enough to deal with the burden that you have articulated, Madam President. I understand that. And I'm glad to go to Harrisburg to find a means by which additional dollars can be brought to bear to help the city. I'm just saying that it's very difficult in this current circumstance as a minority legislator in a minority caucus dealing with a Republican majority in the Senate, a Republican majority in the House, and a governor who's not necessarily evidenced any attention to the fiscal distress of these cities, including mine in the city mm -hmm. of Scranton, and, and to go and ask for additional taxpayer money.
to bring it back home. It's a very difficult challenge. Not one that I'm not up to, not one that I'm not willing to take on, but it is a very difficult challenge. Um, I can certainly understand what you're saying. I, in some respects, have had similar experiences. But as you say, and as I would agree, it doesn't mean that we do not try, that we, we must make every effort to try to help the child that is dying, that remains on life support. I, I think we have all, all of the, the legislators locally, and, and, and you mentioned before uh, about uh, the community. This, this entire region is served by the city of Scranton. It's not just uh, uh, the city of Scranton that benefits from, from the services from the city, and, and the legislators regionally realize that, too, and I can tell you that. Uh, Representative Haggerty is working very hard. Senator Blake is working very hard, as is Representative Flynn. But also the other local legislators, and, and, and being led by uh, Representative Mike Carroll, who is, is better known as being from the greater Pittston area, but Mike heads up the representative, or excuse me, heads up the Northeast delegation. And Mike has made it very clear to all of the legislators in the Northeast District that we will work as a team. And, and it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's good to see that he means that, and, he, mm -hmm. and he, uh, he agrees that what happens in the city of Scranton affects the entire region of northeastern Pennsylvania. And, and while the, the, some of the circumstances that Scranton is facing are exclusive to Scranton, uh, a lot of those same circumstances uh, manifest themselves in different ways in other communities, and a lot of those other communities are faced with those same problems. Uh, we have the city of Harrisburg, who who was faced with a judgment, uh, a, a horrible judgment, and they tried to get out of it with a way of bankruptcy, and, and it seemed to be their only way out, and the court won't allow it. And, and we see where Pittsburgh uh, and Harrisburg and so many other communities are, are faced with so many pieces of property, not unlike Scranton, that are, are tax-free in, in, the, in their city, and they're working, at, working on trying to get around that. And, and I know Senator Blake and Representative Haggerty and Representative Flynn and and all of the others are not only looking at new legislation uh, that c can affect that and, and turn that around, and, and you have talked about it here, I've, I've heard you many times talk about the different ways that perhaps it can be attacked, and, and they are looking at that, and they're looking at other states that have successfully uh, found ways to, to, so to speak, tax nonprofits when it is appropriate, they think, to tax nonprofits, that being when a commercial business is being operated through that nonprofit, or, or commercial money is being made in, in, in a commercial, so to speak, way through that nonprofit. And, and we're all looking at legislation that will address that. And looking at any legislation at all that is going to help to address not only the problems of Scranton, but the problems of so many communities that face those same challenges, although we all feel it uh, so much stronger here in Scranton. Well, yes, because I, you know, I'm obviously bringing you gentlemen here because you represent us as well as our neighbors in this geographical area. So, uh, you know, certainly we're reaching out to you because we feel it is your duty and obligation to serve and represent your constituents rather than, you know, right now I do understand the concerns of other municipalities, the woes of Harrisburg the accomplishments of Pittsburgh, but they have nothing to do with what's happening here. And in terms of, you know, the state assistance that's been given to us up to this point in time, yes, a few million dollars were given to the city, most of which were repaid or must still be repaid. Very little was given in terms of a grant, and frankly, that money well, I'm just going to say it like it is. Was dangled in front of Scranton. Here's some money if you'll do a recovery plan. Agree to that recovery plan and you can have this. Don't agree to that recovery plan, you get nothing. So I, you know, I think it's, we've got to be clear here about what's happened and, and where we're going. And I'm very happy to hear that you know, everyone is so interested in the pursuit of legislation that can be helpful to us. Um, for example, uh, I believe it might have been two years ago, perhaps more, uh, Representative Friedman put forth a bill 
known as the uh, Johnstown liquor tax, perhaps. And unfortunately, that never made it out of committee. Now, this bill, as I understand it, would have provided financial relief to Pennsylvania municipalities. Would any of you be willing to introduce or reintroduce such legislation? Well, Mrs. Evans, let me first uh, start by saying that there's not a time uh, to, to place blame on anybody in the past. Uh, we, we see that in public service all the time. Uh, I'm a freshman representative, but, it, but I'm here because it is time uh, to help Scranton get out of Act 47. Um, it has been a burden uh, to this community. Uh, but just to echo uh, what Senator Blake said, you know, J John Blake is not a person who is going to provide false hope. And he is trying, and others are trying. And we are in a situation in Harrisburg and in Washington where we, we are not in control at this very time. And uh, the money simply will not be there uh, d during, during the time where we're not in leadership position. Uh, but you're, you're talking to us today about property tax relief. And, and that's what I've been dealing with, uh, with the constituents in, in the 112th district. And their concerns are so grave. And they are our child, and they are on life support. And uh, the, you made some great suggestions uh, in terms of the tiers of how we pay our taxes. We're paying one tax bill. And people are losing their homes because uh, those, that tax bill is very, very large. Uh, it's not broken down into county taxes and city taxes and, and school, you know, school taxes. Uh, we have to demonstrate the ability, before we do have s serious help from the state, to do some smaller things at home. And I think that is one of them. And this is, I believe, your suggestion. Um, yes, it was. And I know that it did not uh, come to fruition. But in the meantime, council took measures to um, address that ill as best it could. Specifically, um, we repealed previous legislation that enabled uh, the city to take the homes of our taxpayers by sheriff's sale. Uh, we have hired a new delinquent tax collector who is far more accountable, transparent, and responsible. And the people of the city are no longer in fear of losing their homes to sheriff sales, thanks to the act of this council. So we are, you know, we are frequently at work doing our part, what we can on our level to help our people. But we're asking for, because I'm sure everyone is aware, there are, our hands are tied in so many instances because of state law. Either what it fails to provide or what it does provide that is not, or, or, or what it is requiring of us that's not advantageous. So we seek your help, whether it be through um, a specific bailout, whether it be through a reintroduction of um, a Johnstown liquor tax, um, whether it be through uh, legislation regarding nonprofits that would enable taxation of portions of nonprofits that don't meet their stated missions and don't meet the requirements and criteria set by the law and the Supreme Court. Uh, there, are, there are many instances of payroll tax, for example, for the city of Scranton. There are many instances where we cannot move ahead without your intervention on our behalf. And I do understand that. You know, it's, it's unwise to provide false hope. I do understand that you are fighting against a Republican administration. However, as I stated earlier, we still have the obligation as elected officials to try and to do whatever we can within our realm of ability and possibility to help the child that is suffering the most of all the children you represent. I, I want to, and again, I'll echo some of Kevin's remarks and, and, uh, and even uh, Tom's on behalf of uh, Representative Marty Flynn. We are, as a delegation, trying to work together. We are certainly, I mean, if I come up with ideas on my side of the, of the, of the building and I need a companion uh, on the House, we're going to have that kind of 
two-pronged mm -hmm. thrust on behalf of the city, we will do so. Excellent. There, there are some things going on that I think are important. Uh, we, we, there, there, are, there are really a couple of things to say. First of all, the most important thing we do is deal with the state budget. And within the confines of our debates on that budget, there are decisions that have vast implications, not only for the fiscal health of our city, but for the fiscal health of our school districts and for the safety net that protects our most vulnerable citizens. And in those decisions, I want you to know that every day that I go to the floor and I have to make a vote or every committee I have to go to or every meeting or every person with whom I meet in Harrisburg, I am con contemplating the impacts of that process on this city and its residents. Um, overlaying on your own tax base is the Scranton School District. Uh, if we don't fund public education properly, the Scranton School District doesn't have much choice but to go to the same taxpayers you answer to. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm always cognizant of that. Um, I just met with a whole set of nonprofit providers here uh, who are concerned about their ability to continue to meet behavioral health obligations and other issues associated with uh, the quality of life and the dignity that our people realize in this city and throughout this region. So I'm constantly cognizant of that. There are specific pieces of legislation, and to your point on the nonprofit issue, I, I, I truly believe, and I say this to all of council and to everyone who's listening, that if we get through this process associated with, with what I would call recapturing the authority of the General Assembly as the entity that must promulgate what in fact constitutes a purely public charity, if that process comes to fruition, if you will, at some point we must rewrite legislation on that because it will have been a constitutional amendment that occurred after a law. And in my, the statutory authority of that law, in my opinion, would be compromised by the subsequent constitutional amendment. And I think at that point we must revisit, to your point, this relationship between the purely public charities and our municipal governments. So yes, we will deal with that. It doesn't seem to happen quick enough, Madam President, but I'm telling you that that's what's going to happen down the road. The other issues are specific about trying to move state money into your city and job growth, economic development, community development, infrastructure development are all things that improve the quality of life in this community and that have the potential over the long term to generate additional revenues from your tax base and hopefully build a business community. So Lloyd Smucker has put up a bill he refers to that the city revitalization and improvement zone, and I'm working with his office to see if I can get the city of Scranton included in this when he introduces the bill. And I want you to hear the language of its intentions. It's not unlike the one that was established in Allentown, which was the neighborhood investment zone, which allowed the city of Allentown to essentially take the state and local tax funds created in that city directly back into the city, giving a, an opportunity. This would be a little bit different and perhaps more progressive than a KOZ or a KIZ where, where they're coming to you and saying, would you defer taxes? Mm -hmm. In this case, it's taking a look at the taxes that are generated in a particular geography and collecting them at the state level and then redirecting them back for the revitalization and the assistance in that city. Um, so that's an example that could, if I can get the city of Scranton included in it and, and work with my Republican colleague, I might be able to get something legislated that could have meaningful impact uh, in, a short, in a short term. So we're working on that. Uh, we did land banks uh, legislation last year, which I think is going to have uh, the ability to assist you in dealing with what I would call unproductive property, uh, whether it be blighted property, tangled uh, title, uh, where you can't get access to property, where, where you have a, another alternative at your disposal in order to get access to that, to that property and deal with um, bulk quiet title. Uh, access uh, and opportunities for you to take under what I, I would say underutilized, underperforming, and even blighted property and, and create a more productive use out of it. So that's, again, it's, it's just legislation we just got through last year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only now being rolled out, uh, but I think it could be of some consequence not only for the city but for the county and perhaps the entire region. Uh, there's an historic tax credit uh, piece of legislation we got through that focuses uh, state tax credit. We never had one before. It was always federal. Now we have an historic tax credit at the state level, which again, it was Lloyd Smucker's legislation that came through. I will continue to work with uh, the governing body of this city uh, on legislation that deals with what we spoke about in our meetings, uh, the possible establishment of an ICA uh, and to foreclose upon the issue of 47. I think that might have some value. Um, you mentioned the payroll preparation tax. They did that in Pittsburgh. Um, it is something that I continue to research. I have a little bit of angst about it that I think I shared with you because mm -hmm. the manufacturers are currently exempt from the gross receipts tax right now. And the moment you put a payroll preparation tax, even if you took the gross receipts off of them, or the mercantile tax, you know, it would have a different effect in terms of a tax shift, if you will. 
So I continue to research this and continue to look at it to see if there are means where I can untie your hands or create some additional tools that can help you deal with the challenges you have. Number one, to provide a basic level of services to your people in public safety and in public works. And number two, not to burden them with additional taxation. And that's my job every day. Um, the last thing I think I want to say to you is about public safety. I had the Fraternal Order of Police come to me uh, last week, um, not last week, two weeks ago before Holy Week, uh, to discuss uh, the potential of consolidation of a pension. Um, when the governor first suggested he was going to do some pension reform, I actually started to get excited because I thought, well, maybe we'll look at municipal pensions. We have so many fragmented. They're not very large. They're not very efficient. And they add costs and long-term costs. Uh, to cities like, like Scranton, <clears throat> but he wasn't interested in talking about municipal pensions. He was only interested in talking about SIRS and PSIRS and doing some things mm -hmm. at that level. So um, I plan on taking up a, a deeper look on the municipal pension issue as the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, and if I can find a way forward to create some efficiencies and that would create some opportunity to take the long-term burden off of the city of Scranton and, and like cities that are dealing with this challenge on the pension issue, uh, I, will, I will work very hard on that front as well. Thank you. Um, Representative Haggerty and, and uh, Mr. Welby, are there any bills that you are drafting or may draft or uh, may consider co-sponsoring that would directly help the city of Scranton? Now, I think the senator and I have done most of the talking. We've, we've well, you guys, you guys are the smartest, so uh, we'll let you go. <laughs> We've discussed a payroll tax and uh, other ways in which the county sales tax, uh, other ways in which the senator is trying to work with his Republican colleagues to benefit the city. But is there anything specific that either of you may have in mind uh, that you can do in your position within the House of Representatives to assist us? Well, one of the uh, old House bills, 1776, is always being discussed. And uh, in, my, <clears throat> in my journey around Scranton, uh, it's, it's brought up to me about the 1% uh, sales tax increase uh, to eliminate property taxes. And it, it's something that has to be considered now. And when I say it has to be considered, it's because of the overwhelming majority of people who've talked to me about it. You know, this is not for me to say my personal opinion. I'm mm -hmm. a representative of theirs. And, uh, you know, it's time to explore this. It's time to explore how we, how we pay for our education in, in Pennsylvania in a fair, equal distribution of education, which we do not have, and, and to eliminate and to alleviate uh, property taxes uh, for our people. I, you know, I got this letter today, and I was asked to read it, and if you don't mind, I will, from a, sure. a resident. And uh, she's, I, you know, a lot of the people in, in Scranton have this perception that it's all of our senior citizens who are, having a hard time paying taxes and losing their homes. And this is, this is a young woman in her 30s. And she said, since having children a few years ago, I have been considering leaving Scranton and moving to the Abington Heights School District. Between the property tax, the 3% city tax for my wages, and paying for my kids to go to private school, I have become tapped out. I was born in Scranton, and I love Scranton, but I don't know if I continue to live here. But I don't know what other options I have at this point, especially if the property taxes go up again. And you know, this is, this is the general synopsis of uh, the, the residents of Scranton. And we, we have to come up with a conclusion here. We have to come up with um, bipartisan support. I think it might um, be beneficial to, to bring some of our Republican colleagues to Scranton. Uh, the word distress is a word to come and to listen, to see your faces, to hear the anguish, to bring testimony here, to allow the governor of Pennsylvania to know that he's the governor of a city that has the highest unemployment in Pennsylvania. That's his responsibility to do something about it. Um, there, there are times and moments when you need to put pressure on the leaders, and I think right now is the perfect time to put pressure on our governor, yes. uh, where he may listen a little more than he usually does. Yes, uh, so, understood. And, and again, I won't sit here and pretend uh, to have the, the expertise and knowledge uh, as Senator Blake does. I, I am in office about three months now. Uh, I'm, I'm learning. I'm listening. Uh, Ms. Evans, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight as hard as I possibly can uh, when, when our taxes come, we're concerned, my wife and I, and we both have good jobs, but we still live paycheck to paycheck, and, and we worry. Uh, and I think it's important to have legislators like, like John Blake, whose sole job is this job, not senators and representatives who have 
other jobs and other pensions. And when there's a tax increase, they don't even blink an eye. It doesn't matter to them. Um, we have legislators here today that their sole lives are to, you know, public service of this area. And we know what it means when a, when a tax increase comes. You know, I want to say one thing before I turn it over to, to Marty's able representative here. Um, Benjamin Franklin wanted a unicameral legislature, but he didn't get one. Um, anything that can possibly get done on behalf of the city requires und undivided cooperation with my House colleagues. I, I have to have comparable legislation achieved in the House that, that matches up with what I might pursue in the Senate. Um, and, and, and the energies of my House members in engaging their Republican colleagues on what are, what are hopefully bipartisan, bicameral efforts that could assist this city, that is essential in the dynamic. Um, because if I get something through the Senate, that doesn't do it. Yes. It's got to get through the House. And so that's, that's one of the critical, important things to, to be reminded of. I, I have a constant dialogue whenever there's an opportunity for that, for that, um, that common purpose. Uh, to, to be put up legislatively, and sometimes it's a House bill that gets back to the Senate, sometimes it's a Senate bill that gets back to the House. One way or the other, we need that common effort. So all of us represent the same constituency, and we have an obligation to work together. And we do. The, um, uh, the, uh, we all are interested in, in uh, the sales tax bill. I mean, that's something that, that we're all looking at, and, and adding that 1% that may not be the total answer, but it certainly is a big help. And, and, and it will increase the tax over uh, many more products and services than, than it is right now, and that's going to be a burden on some people. But it's, uh, I, I think we all agree, or many of us agree, that we have to take the burden off of the property owners. The property owners can no longer shoulder that incredible responsibility that's been thrown on them uh, for various reasons, like the judgments that have come down against the city and the increases in the, the, the taxes from our school district. Uh, and the, and the county taxes, it's, it's just too much as property owners. We just can't do it anymore. And so many of the property owners here in Scranton are senior citizens on fixed in, or people on fixed incomes, uh, and, and they just can't do it anymore. And, and so we're hoping for that, but it's not just that. We all are looking, as I said before, for ways to find new revenue, whether it be through uh, increased payments from nonprofits or finding ways to legally uh, and appropriately tax nonprofit services that uh, are a commercial venture at their property. Uh, and, and, and there's little things that we're doing too that Senator Blake and Representative Flynn and Representative Haggerty are doing for our city as well. One of the first things that, that we started working on back in December before Marty was sworn in was trying to find a way to find funds to open the pools in the city of Scranton. Now granted that's a lot of pools and it's a lot of money and we know that. But we've been, been looking since uh, three weeks before he was sworn in into trying to find ways to find that funding. And, and some of the conversations we have had are with private businesses for them to also make uh, private donations from corporations and businesses as well. But we, we all, we're, we're, we're in such a con confined space as far as the, the ability to go to for revenue uh, that we're, we're we're not thinking out of the box. We're we're thinking, we're thinking out of the factory. We're we're out there looking for things, and we need from you. Uh, I, I'm I'm sure that you all have been been checking out some different things and perhaps some different ideas that different communities and different states have been doing. And and if you could share that with us, we uh, I, I I know that I speak for for Mr. Haggerty and, and Mr. Joy, excuse me, Mr. Blake when I say that. We are open 24-7 if you want to sit down and talk about different ideas that you have that, that you have read about or heard about uh, from, from other communities or other states. We want to hear it and we want to get it done, uh, believe me, as much as you do. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, at, at least what I have heard from uh, many residents and, and I've uh, spoken to tonight and I'll reiterate once more, you know, we're looking for state legislation on a payroll tax, state legislation on um, proper taxation of nonprofits, state legislation on property reassessment, uh, state legislation similar to the Johnstown liquor tax. You know, we, we need specifics. Governor, we understand what you're saying. Government has other plans for that, I would, I would add. But 
Pardon? I, I said the governor has other plans for that, as you might, as you might have read. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, I, I empathize. Mm -hmm. And uh, more than probably anyone here, I know what that's like mm -hmm. because I lived that for eight to nine years. But I also know that when there is a true crisis, leaders are, well, true leaders have the ability to set aside political differences, philosophical differences, personal differences, to solve problems that will save the people it serves, that will save the cities it serves. And, um, you know, I've seen it happen here. I wish it would happen in Washington. And I still hold out hope, particularly at this time, as you so um, insightfully <laughs> mentioned to us. It's a very good time, I think, to be working with the governor and the, your Republican colleagues, some of them, um, to gather support for your legislation in order to help this city. And I do like the idea that was proposed by uh, Representative Haggerty that your Republican colleagues should come here. Mm -hmm. They should see and hear what occurs in this city, and not simply through the voices of city council, but through the voices of the people you represent, the old, the young, the middle class, the families who are struggling, eking out a living, working two and three jobs, mothers working two and three jobs, fathers, so that there's very little supervision for children at home and we know the costs of daycare, and we know what, um, what the governor has done to public education in our commonwealth. You know, that, that's something particularly with which I'm familiar, and that uh, is, is a personal cause where I'm concerned. So I do understand what you're trying to do there to help public education, and that is imperative, I agree. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm asking you to remember that this city is unique. And as each of you, particularly um, Mr. Welby and Representative Haggerty have said, the people can't afford these constant tax increases. And they're coming not only from the city, but the county, and the school district, although I'll give the school district credit, it had no increase this year, but they regularly do increase taxes. Mm -hmm. um, the city, the city has to have some help. You know, we we can't have the nonprofits turning away, the state of Pennsylvania turning away, um, our neighbors turning away. Everyone has shut the doors on us and in fact said to all of these people and the people watching at home tonight that you're on your own. It's your burden. You pay for it. You pay for it by yourselves. And frankly, we don't care how you do it. Just do it. And then there are even those, none of you, none of us, who will say they can probably afford it. You know, I bet they complain, but they'll come up with the money. I've heard that said to me, but I know better because I've been here 10 years. And throughout those 10 years, I've been to so many homes, so many neighborhood meetings, met with so many legislators. I know what they're going through. I was raised that way. I began my marriage that way. I'm going back into that period of life now that's very similar to others. I was fortunate, very fortunate for a period of time. I'm no longer in that category, but I'm very cognizant that most of the people in this city have a far more difficult time than I. Yeah. Madam President, just a, a few comments, because I actually have to teach a class at the university tonight, so I'm watching the clock. 
I, uh, you're not alone. You're not alone. Um, I know that myself and my colleagues are deeply uh, mindful of everything that you've said here tonight and all the, and the appeals that you make on behalf of the people of this city. We are deeply mindful of it. I'm mindful of it every day that, I, that I'm on this job. Um, there are going to be opportunities for us to show some courage, I believe, legislatively. I mean, you have to fight the battle and you have to put it in writing and you have to introduce it and you have to advocate for it. Yes. And I would tell you um, that perhaps because other cities, other third class cities are struggling with the same, again, I, 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 I agree with the distinction that you draw with respect to the Supreme Court ruling because that is unique. Uh, but the other issues associated with fiscal distress that have been prevailing upon our smaller cities across this commonwealth are pervasive and they are feeling the same crunch that you're feeling in trying to meet basic needs and services to their people. There, and it's a bipartisan issue. There are Republican mm -hmm. legislators in the Senate that are going back to their district that are meeting mayors and councils that are struggling with the similar challenges you are. Maybe with that dialogue, we can in fact produce public policy that gets to the, the governor's desk for signature that will free up the shackles that you're under, create some opportunity for investment that would change the trajectory of the fiscal performance of the city and take the burden off the taxpayers. That's what we're working on every day. Um, and I promise you that we'll continue to do so and that my door will always be open and that my coordination with the House members uh, will be thoughtful and perpetual. And uh, we hope we can give you some evidence of that courage and, and, and that commitment uh, as we continue to serve the people of Thank Lackawanna you. County and the city. Very quickly, mm -hmm. if any of my colleagues, Councilman Rogan, Loscom and Joyce. Would I have just, any I'll be very brief. I just have a few brief questions. Um, and first, I'd like to um, just mention uh, Councilman McGough called me before the meeting to, he wanted to apologize that he couldn't make it today. He really did want to be here. Um, I just have a couple questions for Senator Blake and a couple quick comments. Um, the first one, could you explain, and, and we disagree on this issue, the 1% the sales tax specifically only for Lackawanna County instead of a statewide sales tax to reduce property taxes? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not adverse to considering an issue on a statewide basis, but I, I would tell you that if, if, if you're talking about the Independence Act, which, which uh, Kevin Haggerty, Representative Haggerty mentioned earlier, about just eliminating property taxes and just doing either a sales tax or an income tax uh, to fund public education, um, again, I, I've looked at it and the concern that I have is that the moment you begin to rely upon sales taxes or income taxes as a means to fund public education, when economies suffer or go into recession, you don't generate that sales, right now we're not generating sales tax revenue because our economy is in a malaise. Uh, I get concerned about the predictability of that as a source to guarantee we can meet the $30 billion cost that public education costs. But let me step back a moment to get more to the heart of your question. The City of Philadelphia right now already has. Uh, an increase in sales tax. The, the county of Allegheny already has a sales tax. There is no other county among the other 65 counties of this commonwealth that enjoys the same option. The counties that are in the Marcellus Shale region right now are benefiting from the impact fee. They'd have no interest in a sales tax. They have sufficient dollars coming to meet their obligations, I believe. But it's places like Lackawanna County and Luzerne County and Monroe County and these other counties that don't have those kinds of additional, what I would call supplemental revenues that I think should be given the option of relieving the property tax burden by diverting it to a larger tax base in the form of an optional county sales tax. Um, I'm, I'm not yet convinced that the complete transition from property tax to sales tax or income tax can guarantee our ability to meet the tab for public education on a statewide basis. Because my concern and the concern that residents and business owners brought up to me with having a specifically only Lackawanna County wide is it's a 15 minute ride to Wyoming County, it's a 15, 20 minute ride to Luzerne County. Mm -hmm. And I know there is, there is a provision that if somebody, you know, for instance, a big ticket purchase such mm -hmm. as a vehicle. You're talking about uniformity across so that you don't have that difference yes. between county borders. Yeah, my, my fear yeah. would be that it would, implementing a 1% sales tax specifically in Lackawanna County mm -hmm. would hurt businesses in the county. And because businesses are hurting jobs would leave the county. By um, implementing it statewide, you'd have to, you know, travel quite a ways to, uh, you mm -hmm. know, to avoid that, that, extra, that extra tax. And I understand that Philadelphia and um, Allegheny County, they have these types of taxes. But we saw when the previous council instituted a smoking ban that Scranton is a, is a whole other um, 
ball of wax than a big city like Philadelphia mm -hmm. when the smoking ban was put into place specifically in the city, bar and tavern owners in the city were run out of business because people who liked to smoke when they drank would go to <coughs> Dunmore, Taylor, Old Forge, that's 25 minutes away. <coughs> so we're in a little bit of a different situation than a very large city like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do appreciate all, all three of you coming here, and I know I, I've brought this issue up to all three of you at one point in a time or another. Um, I firmly support um, the elimination of property taxes to fund education. Um, the residents in the city have, many of them, have brought that to me, to my colleagues, and I'm sure to you as well, mm -hmm. um, especially senior citizens. Many who will say, you know, I've paid for property, I've paid property taxes all these years, my children have been out of the school district for 50 years, or maybe they sent their children to private school, and they can't afford to keep their homes. I've talked to people who have lived in a house their entire life that they grew up in, and then they, they inherit it from their parents, continue to live there in many of our neighborhoods in Scranton, and when they get that tax bill, they can't afford to pay it. So they're facing the option of selling the home and leaving the area, which if you drive anywhere through the city, you'll see there are numerous houses for sale in this city. Mm -hmm. And when these folks leave, that further reduces our tax base and leaving the rest of us here to pay more. So then, you know, I'm sure, I think it was mentioned by Representative Haggerty that the school district portion of the taxes for the Scrantonian is the highest portion. Mm -hmm. Even though many times people think it's the city, it is actually the school district. And if we could have help on the state with aid from the state on reducing that tax on the taxpayers, if the city tax were to go up or the county tax to, were to go up on property, it wouldn't hurt them as much because most of the purchases that the lower income family and senior citizens are making are tax exempt, mm -hmm. such as food, um, medicine, things of that nature. They're not paying sales tax on it already. Mm -hmm. And you know that person is gonna be paying a very small amount of tax when the person like myself who does have three good jobs, expendable income, I'll be paying more, and as I should, you know, on, on, on things that are, are more of a, not a necessity, more of a want than a need. Right. I think, and I'll just make a very couple brief comments. I, I don't disagree with, with your assessment of the burden that this imposes, um, and particularly on fixed income seniors and, and younger families trying to get started. Um, the, the, the ideologically, I mean, the issue of, of, the, of the optional county sales tax is exactly an attempt at trying to reduce that burden. Um, you make a good point about creating, uh, you know, hopefully not having this uneven issue that could be a uh, competitive, economically competitive situation. Uh, so I'm certainly willing to, to take a closer look at that. Um, but, but you also make a compelling argument that we might have, we might want to think above a larger diversification of the tax base to fund, you know, to fund not only school districts but municipal services as well. So, I mean, I think we're in the same space. It's how do you implement it and how do you guarantee that it doesn't, have what I would call a, 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 a disproportional consequence of one slice of the, of the local economy or another. But the key at the end of the day is that the reliance on property taxes, the sole reliance on property taxes that you as council and the mayor have to rely on to meet, to meet your burden uh, of providing basic uh, services to your residents and that the school district must rely on is, is archaic. It's obsolete. And, and we really need to think, I think, 21st century on this point. We certainly agree on that point, and, and another thing that somebody brought up to me is actually a, a landlord in the city, you know, he said, when, when my taxes go up, I'm not eating it, it's the tenants. So it's renters as well that are paying more in their rent when property taxes go up. So it doesn't just affect the property owner, renters as well. If anyone who rents from a person or a business other than a nonprofit feels the pinch when taxes go up. And um, one final point, I, I think it's great that the three of you came here. This is very productive. I think it's something that hopefully we could do in the future. And I hope that um, you would be agreeable to either monthly or at the very least quarterly meetings um, between council, hopefully the mayor would be in attendance, and our, our three, two representatives and our senator. And if they, if they were quarterly, I would propose that once each quarter, once would be in the city, once would be in your office, Senator Blake, once in Representative Flynn's and once in Representative Hag Haggerty's, where we could go around and, and continue this dialogue um, to get ideas together um, from the residents and, and meet as a group.
to try to move forward with um, some ideas that could that could help the people in Scranton and, and other your districts. So thank Certainly. you for coming, and, and I hope you could take us up on that offer. Thanks, Pat. Is there anything else? Uh, first of all, I, I just want to thank you, gentlemen, for, for coming here. And as Senator Blake said, they, you do have an open-door policy. I'm witness to that. I've met with the Senator Blake many times. Um, Mr. Welby here. I still have to get up to see Mr. Haggerty, but uh, I will be stopping in uh, with issues and, and stuff like that. But uh, that is true. You, you've always been there, and uh, hopefully this will continue, and our dialogue will continue and be progressive, and I believe Mrs. Evans spoke so eloquently on, on all of our concerns, and uh, I won't belabor any of the points. Thank you very much. Councilman Joyce? Yes, I have a few comments and questions. I saw an interesting sign today that stated, create solutions, not problems. And I think that, you know, from being in government the time that I have, uh, one of the, the main problems that I see is that things move very slow and, and sometimes there's a struggle to get things passed through and I think a lot of that is um, just because of politics and, and the nature of how things are. But one thing that um, in my conversations with other uh, finance chairs throughout the Commonwealth I spoke to uh, William Peduto about the payroll expense tax that Pittsburgh has. And that's something I see could be a great benefit for Scranton if the business privilege and mercantile tax are eliminated and business are, businesses are paying a payroll expense tax instead. But one thing that I would like to see happen is that nonprofits are added to the payroll expense tax. And that's something that Mr. Peduto and I discussed. And in Pittsburgh, he said that would have solved many of their problems. Now, I, I want to know, would you be in support of a payroll expense tax that included nonprofits paying on payroll expenses, obviously? You know, I, I'm not sure constitutionally how that, how that works. I mean, I'd have, to, I'd have to come to a better understanding of it. What I understood would happen in Pittsburgh is, is that the nonprofits, again, they're dealing on a different scale than we're dealing with here in the city of Scranton. But my understanding is the nonprofits did uh, come up with significant pilots at the same time that the city was transitioning off of its gross receipts and mercantile taxes and onto the payroll preparation tax. So it was the combination, I think, that made that work. I only answer your question this way, Councilman, because I believe that the fact that they did not include them in the nonprofits had to do with their legal authority to do so and the constitutional means by which it could be implemented or levied. Um, my, my feeling is that we need to deal with, again, I, I've been long in discussion with the Council President on this issue of the payroll preparation tax and I continue to research it and I continue to struggle a little bit in getting the kind of data I need to understand what the implications would be for the city uh, because I do think that there is some merit in it significant merit in it, it, particularly for a small business. You know, you take the gross receipts and the mercantile tax off of those small businesses are only paying on the basis of their payroll, smaller payroll, smaller tax burden. So it, it might become a more even dis distribution of tax burden. I, I believe that that's probably the appropriate way to go. Uh, but whether or not the nonprofits could be captured by that, I think, is a constitutional issue. And what I would more likely rather see is that we redefine the relationship between the nonprofits and local government vis-a-vis -vis additional legislation that relates to pilots and silots and other things that I think could change the dynamic which is so acrimonious now and that can only be resolved in court. Um, my feeling is that we should rewrite the rules on that in order for that relationship between the nonprofits that are powerful economic drivers in our communities, the Eds and the Meds, uh, as well as the churches who are so important to the fabric of our community and the other nonprofits. Um, you know, I think that we need to deal with that relationship with municipal government while we're considering changes in tax policy. I'm not sure I can capture it all in one blow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another thing I wanted to bring up is I am in support of a, um, a sales tax to offset property taxes. I think that we need to help the homeowners, especially in the city of Scranton right now. <clears throat> One thing I wanted to say, though, is um, the sales tax, 
that's currently being proposed, how likely do you see it as something that would go through? Well, I'll, I'll respond in, in this way. Um, I only had one Republican co-sponsor when I did it last year. I think I've just reintroduced it within the past month or so. Um, actually, I got an email from Nancy on that, so I'm not sure exactly when that happened. But um, I'm not sure if I have any additional Republican co-sponsors that, that have come on board with my idea. Uh, however, my idea is just one idea. Uh, what Councilman Rogan mentioned about a broader uh, sales tax uh, might be something that's being considered. I know that another Republican senator has put forth something that might resemble what I've put forth, but I believe has to do with, again, a county option. Uh, where all the dollars go to t property tax relief, that there'd be no other discretion. It'd be a true tax shift, uh, which is slightly different from, from the plan that I put forth. Um, so my feeling is that there's, a, there's kind of like a, a growing momentum around this idea to try to change that tax structure and to try to change that sole burden on, on property taxes. I, I sense a change in the General Assembly on both sides. I, I'd let my House members speak to what, what might be happening there. The only other thing that I would throw in in answer to your question, Councilman, is that when I originally wanted this, because I believed it was the appropriate thing to do to focus on the municipal government and the municipal shift and the municipal relief, the school districts, you know, they come in and say, well, if you're going to do a sales tax and you're going to apportion it in a way that helps municipal government, we would like you to do a sales tax and apportion it to reduce, right, mm -hmm. school taxes. So then there gets to be a little bit of a tug of war between these and, and the county and the school district and the municipal or all taxing authorities that are looking for ways to deal with that shift. So I think that's the challenge to get momentum right. behind a plan that could have the broadest consensus and the best possible benefit in shifting that burden. And I think that's what we need to work out in Harrisburg. I agree. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Well, you know, as, as has been stated already, absent your <coughs> aggressive efforts and assistance, our city will die and the clock is ticking. We need action and we need your help now. And so we respectfully request that you consider all that has been discussed here this evening and that you would draft sponsor and or pursue legislation to fight for the good people of this city and to and to fight for this city's survival and on behalf of Scranton City Council I'd like to thank all of you for your participation this evening and if there are no further comments or questions Mrs. Evans I would just like to um take a moment to talk of, about a, a resident of Scranton who passed away last night, uh, Mr. Ray Nearhood, uh, who is a political activist. And uh, Mr. Nearhood became personally attached to, to myself because he was my Republican opponent in my house race. And he was in a car accident eight months ago, and he, he passed away last night. And I've, I only met uh, Ray twice, and he has some friends here today. And our conversations were long, and he was intelligent, and I learned from him, and I liked him. And that's what we need to do in public service. We need to learn from our counterparts, our colleagues, the people who are on the other side. Uh, so I think we should learn from his life and take a moment to tell his wife and children that they're in our thoughts and prayers. Indeed. Thank you very much. And if there's nothing further, thank, thank you. you. Thank this you. public caucus is adjourned.
please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who died this past week, particularly Margaret A. McGrath, beloved mother of our friend Harry, grandmother, great-grandmother, sister, and aunt, Robert W. Davis, devoted grandfather and former deep, or excuse me, devoted grandfather of former DPW employee Donald, great-grandfather and uncle, Rainier Hood, loving husband, father, uncle of Jamie Marciano and John May, and their dear families and many friends they leave behind. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loscom? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. The minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held February 27, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, minutes of the Scranton Police Pension Meeting held February 27, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, minutes of the Firemen's Pension Commission Meeting held February 27, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, agenda for the Zoning Hearing Board to be held April 10, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Are there any clerk's notes tonight, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Just one. Um, I received this um, just a few minutes or a few hours ago from Linda Abley. Um, OECD will be participating in the home show in South Scranton. Um, it will take place Monday, April 29th from noon to 6 at 638 Hemlock Street. Um, the Office of Community Development will participate and you can learn more about the city's uh, home buyers programs and how you could uh, become a homeowner in the city if you meet certain guidelines, there are programs available. So the city will be there and it's called the South Scranton Home Ownership, home Ownership Fair, but it's for the entire city. It's for all Scrantonians, not just those in South Scranton. So I just wanted to announce that. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, um, the Pinebrook Neighborhood Association will be having a meeting Tuesday, April 9th at 6.30 p.m. at Antonio's Pizza on 9.30 Kapalsa Avenue. Nothing further? Mrs. Craig? Fourth order, citizens' participation. Our first speaker tonight is Ozzie Quinn. Good evening, Ozzy Quinn, Taxpayers Association. I want to thank Mrs. Evans and uh, the rest of the council for bringing forth the legislators there tonight. Uh, it might be, hopefully, it'll be the first in a, of many, many meetings, like Mr. Ogid said. My only problem is they're talking about sales tax and they're talking about the personnel tax. And you know what? There's 80, approximately 80 taxpayers groups across the state uh, we formed. Okay. And I'm well aware of House Bill 76 and Senate Bill 76. None of them have signed it. So they're telling you, yeah, we'll go 1% sales tax. We will go, and yet they have failed to sign it. So uh, in the future, if they're giving you lip service, just tell them, okay? No more lip service. You know, they must think that we fell off a banana truck down there in Lackawanna Avenue or something. God, that, that burns me up. The other thing is this here. 
you know, that Sandy Hook, that really took a lot out of people in the United States, you know, and the Colorado and everything like there, and the guns and uh, the magazines, uh, over 10 bullets and so on. Well, you know what? I'm asking the city council to look into this matter here locally, okay, and see if they can't get some legislation together. All right? Actually, um, Mr. Quinn, I've been working on that. Uh, my first order of business was addressing sequestration and the uh, next legislation mm -hmm. that we'll put forth will be regarding gun control. Good, good. The reason I say that is just because of the fact that I get up here and you people get abused by the Scranton Times. There's no doubt about it, okay? I picked up the paper today on one of the inserts, eight pages. I'm not going to mention the distorted name of guns and gun paraphernalia. 25 round clips of the Zuman Hall. Okay? They're advertising. They're making money on it. And they don't care what the, what the circumstances may be. It may be dire circumstances. And, you know, what, what, you just don't like a critical place like that. I hope you look at that in the 70s and when you're used to try to get involved. And you know what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people that give you a lot of editorial, a lot of snake gas. But when it comes to really doing it, they care for the buck, and that's all they care about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Elman. I would like to compliment council on their words before, but they're, they're years and years too late, you know. I think they fell on deaf ears like I sit here all the time complaining that you don't listen to me. And I'd like to ask your leisure with me tonight. I had a spinal tap. <laughs> I think my mouth goes off about 10 minutes before my brain gets engaged. You know, as I look at council once more, I can just imagine all of you think and say, here we go again. You're partially right and partially wrong. Last Friday morning, before 6 o'clock, I was having coffee with Mr. DeNaples, and you probably don't believe that, but I get up that early sometimes, especially when, when you get the calling like that, you know. And as I've said, when you mess with someone's pocketbook, it makes it most irritable, and so he was. I don't know if the mayor's going to sign this, this into law or not, Uh, but our, our city's like Humpty Dumpty. There, there is no way, tax-wise, of putting it back together again. And this would just be, I don't know, just one more burden on the taxpayers if, if you guys lose in court, which there's no doubt. If this goes to court, it, it's going to be a disaster for the, the taxpayers. You know, you're going against all odds, but maybe you got some support from Les Spindler. But the one man who knows about lawsuits, that's Attorney Kelly, has advised against this to drop it. I, I just don't know why you're pursuing the, this avenue about this road, you know, this hundred-year-old road, do you know where it used to lead to? There used to be a meat processing plant down there 70, 80 years ago. It had truck traffic before 90% of these houses were built. It's a precedent that's been set. You know, it's in stone. I don't know. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm trying to be diplomatic with you people and not get somebody mad. We, we the taxpayers, put, put you guys in those seats to help us and, and, and to lead. I'm talking about the, the little people in this city and the big people, everybody, the, the people that sent a man to the moon and brought him back, those people. And now you're expecting, you're expecting a, a tax increase. If you lose this, that will be monumental. I know who, the, who you're going to go against in court if it goes that far. It, it's, it's a losing proposition for the taxpayer, and I'm one of them. That's why I'm standing here crying about it. I don't know. I don't think this is a very good way to win voters and influence bankers myself. And, and sooner or later, we're going to run out of bankers to borrow from. So then you fall back on the tax, you know, just we have to raise taxes again, people. I'm sorry. Last Sunday, uh, in the letters to the editor of Mr. Taylor, I believe, wrote, in three years, it would be 78% tax increase. And if you lose a lawsuit like this, 78% people be wishing it was just 78%. It, it, it'd be, it, it'd just be, it, it's just a un, needed, unnecessary occurrence to push this so much. You know, we've had the, 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 these problems with the schools and the colleges and nothing was done. We got these unscrupulous bunch of developers here that everybody just goes, bends backwards to help them and they beat us out of millions and millions of dollars left and right. We got the charlatan like the school and, and, and here you are worrying about a road. It's just, it's just got to stop. Thank you. I thank you for letting me speak. Our next speaker is Doug Miller. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Before Good evening. I get into the uh, main issue tonight, I just would like to um, address an issue that was uh, a concern brought up by a, a taxpayer that I happened to come across uh, a few days ago over in uh, West Scranton on St. Anne Street. Um, in the 1300 block, um, a resident uh, expressed uh, much concern over large cracks and potholes that have caused uh, uh, many problems for vehicles uh, commuting through that part of uh, that block daily. Um, this resident uh, did express to me, in fact, that uh, the, the, the biggest problem they have is in the uh, late evening hours or, you know, when they finally do go to sleep for the night. Uh, they've noticed that many vehicles that do travel over that road, uh, it does cause a disturbance and, and wakes up a few of the neighbors during the night. Uh, I was told that numerous requests were sent to Mr. Dewar and DPW, um, obviously falling on deaf ears. Um, I did promise her that I would uh, raise this issue tonight at Council and, and hopefully we can have it resolved once and for all. Um, I won't announce the address over the air just out of respect of this uh, individual. I will leave it in the office tonight after the meeting and hopefully uh, somebody from, uh, an, a representative from DPW can travel over and take a look at it and uh, try to clarify this issue once and for all. Uh, on to the, uh, the main issue tonight in regards to the um, caucus we uh, had here tonight with uh, a few of our uh, elected uh, legislative leaders, Mr. Blake, Mr. Haggerty, and uh, Mr. Welby, who represented uh, Mr. Flynn tonight. Uh, certainly a productive uh, caucus. I think we were able to discuss a lot of the issues and concerns we've had that certainly a distressed city for nearly 20 years has had to face. Uh, but as I sat back and listened to uh, these uh, individuals speak tonight, uh, I was somewhat uh, concerned by a few of the answers and, and certainly the direction that we're headed in. Um, I personally don't feel that the Pennsylvania Economy League or uh, DCED, uh, the Department of Community and Economic Development in Pennsylvania, uh, has served a positive uh, purpose. Um, I think they've done nothing more than cause more burdens, particularly on the residents of this city through massive tax increases through the years. Um, and I don't think they've led us down the right path. I think they've caused more headaches than anything else. Uh, that's my belief. 
And I know that's the belief of many residents of this city because they felt it when they get their tax bills each year. I think that Pell's made a lot of unrealistic expectations of us through the recommendations of, as I've said, tax increases and, and a lot of the, uh, the public safety cuts they proposed and that it certainly have even um, gone into effect by this administration and their actions. Uh, I think a lot of the problems we currently face could have been avoided had Pell and DCED had our, our interests truly in mind. And, and perhaps if they advised the administration properly, um, they would have been willing to sit down with the unions 10 years ago. And we wouldn't be looking at this $17 million Supreme Court ruling. That was cut in half, let's, let's, let's not forget that, by the unions, because they knew that it was going to place quite a burden on the residents of the city. Um, another point was brought up, uh, we, we discussed, can the state come in and, and somehow bail out the city, so to speak? And we couldn't get a, a direct assurance that that was the case. Uh, we seem to want to discuss what other communities are going through. And a good point was brought up that Scranton's problems are quite unique compared to similar cities such as Harrisburg and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and other municipalities, Reading uh, and the Commonwealth. We've faced challenges that many of these other municipalities haven't faced for the last 20 years. Um, you know, you would think when you're in distressed status for over 20 years and you have these overseers advising you that you would think you would be able to turn this around and, and move forward. We seem to continue to just go backwards and we haven't resolved any of our problems. Um, we've, we've placed many band-aids and, and just one-time fixes on our yearly problems and it doesn't address the long-term solution. And that is how do we get out of debt? Where's the money going to come from? I mean, how much more are we going to take out of the taxpayers? And that's why it's important to have our elected leaders on, on the state uh, end coming in and asking questions and trying to figure out on their end what they can do in the legislature to try to bring money into the city. Um, you know, many people may say, well, you caused the problems. It's your obligation to fix them. Well, these are three individuals that represent a lot broader base of people uh, in the community, and they have an obligation to look out for the taxpayers of this city, and they have an obligation to ensure that this city turns around. And it's my hope that by the, having this discussion tonight, these individuals will leave here, going back to Harrisburg and discuss, having discussions with their fellow colleagues and the governor and the Republicans, and putting politics aside. Uh, because it's been proven that when you do that, good things can happen. You know, if we take a trip back to last summer, many people didn't think that we could get this council and the administration to come together. But it was council who took the initiative to put politics aside and egos aside and work and cooperate with the mayor. And that's why we were able to come up with a recovery plan. And we were able to help alleviate the burden on the taxpayers. Remember, that recovery plan wanted to see nearly an 80% tax increase. And I remember that, and I'm sure the residents do. But this council cut that down to a 22% tax increase because they knew the residents couldn't afford it and that we needed other alternative revenue sources. And hopefully they'll all come into fruition. A few of them we discussed tonight, the sales tax and a few of the others. Um, you know, Mr. Blake brought up a point that the state did give the city $3 million. Well, if we're going to come up and we're going to gloat about $3 million, which most of it was uh, were loans that we have to pay back, uh, that's not something we should be bragging about over 20, within 20 years. Uh, we need answers, we need solutions, and we need our uh, state officials to step up. They have an obligation to help turn the city around. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Dobson. Mrs. Evans, may, may I interrupt for one moment, point of interest? Yes. Thank you kindly. Um, earlier before the meeting started, uh, someone had pointed out to me that one of the participants or one of the people in the audience had a pin on uh, um, saying, and I asked them to remove it and they were gracious enough to remove it. So I just wanted to alert you to that. They were very kind and didn't question my, that I asked them to. I'm, I'm hoping it was okay with council. Yes. And that I assured them that if anybody else was seen with a pin or any type of uh, thing, I would ask them also to do it, so. Yes, right. Thank you. absolutely, uniformity. Right. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Dave Dobson, President of Scranton. Uh, okay, uh, now, I've been railing for weeks and months and years about trade packs, and one of the things that I'm, I feel a lot of candidates and uh, and people currently serving are guilty of is eternal optimism. The reason our country is in a trash bag and our city is in a trash bag, we're a microcosm of that, is trade pacts. For instance, we have a NAFTA trade pact. Well, in Canada, 
they bought the German Leopard tank instead of the A1 Abrams tank, even though we have a trade agreement. And they equipped their military with that. So where's the reciproca reciprocation? And uh, that, that's a big reason why we're in the tank is because of trade packs that have no obligation to each other or, or the next person. And uh, last week, uh, St. Peter's Square, was it, parking lot? I would please, please plead with you people to nix that. We don't need another parking lot in this town. That man came up with the big story as a developer, either develop it or just pay taxes on an empty lot, and please plant some grass before we arrest you for blight. Uh, the lamps in the chamber, I had problems when I did the taxpayers with both of these side lights creating a nasty buzz, so you seem to have solved that, so I'll move on. Uh, don't turn those lights on. <laughs> we have enough light in here now. And uh, uh, I gave a few articles to uh, uh, Frank Joyce so, uh, from the Times, so you might want to look at them. They're different things that are aforementioned. There's a lot of things bopping back and forth about taxes in the legislature. And in reality, from the common man working class point, they're really not in a lot of our better interests. So you might even want to make copies of them. Uh, for instance, uh, they have uh, to get uh, the uh, uh, state tax, wage tax, up to four and a quarter percent. Well, now I've been hearing on a left-wing radio station that there's also some kind of plan on the back burner to allow employers to keep 95 percent of that tax deducted. Why are you raising my taxes to allow an employer to turn around and pocket 95 percent under the guise of creating jobs? Why would you do that? Other than it's just a ploy to take care of their friends. And, uh, there, there's a lot of different things. A lot of these taxes that I'm hearing about sales taxes and property taxes, they're all regressive. None of them are progressive. Uh, you owe them regardless of whether you're even homeless with a, a sales tax. You could be buying something that you need and uh, uh, you don't even own property in the town. So, I mean, that's something we just want to consider before we uh, have them slip the same old, same old in the back door. And uh, I'd like to mention to our Times reporter that the uh, real tax rate in Scranton is 3.4 percent, am I correct? Mm -hmm. uh, wage tax, I think I read in an article that he deduced it was 2.4. It's probably well, just I, a little I, bit of 2.4 percent goes to the city, 1 right, percent right. goes to the well, city. So I think, I think he when was, it was probably all added just together. referring to the city's portion. Yeah, yeah, uh, so that's something we want to uh, correct if, if it needs to be corrected. Uh, um, now, uh, on the Golden Parrot, North Carolina, uh, the state is establishing a state religion. Now, that's in, uh, in opposition to the First and Fourteenth Amendment and the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution, and it's a damn good reason for taxing the churches that are pushing it. And uh, there's a Shapiro in the uh, FEC, FC, federal uh, FCEC, uh, and uh, uh, Security and Exchange, SEC, Security and Exchange, and she's taken uh, a job now with, uh, with the uh, uh, law firm that specializes in uh, uh, helping people like Bernie Madoff avoid the radar. So thanks a lot, Mrs. Shapiro, and good riddance. I hope you don't ever run for government again or get appointed to government. We need a law that states that people need five years off if they want to go into government outside of uh, or into a private institution outside of uh, government. Thank you Thank and have you. a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, that concludes the sign-in sheet. Is there anyone else who cares to address council?
Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I'd like to ask <coughs> Mr. Joyce a question, if I could. May I, please? Sure. I'd just like to ask, um, since you're the finance chair, what is the shortfall of the budget gonna, going to be by the end of the year? Do you have any idea? I, I actually wanted to address this during motions. We haven't received a cash flow report from our business administrator's office with all the latest projections. So I, I will uh, request that this week and hopefully report on it next week. Okay, I, I appreciate of that. What, of what's currently overperforming and underperforming as far as revenues and expenditures. Okay. Um, the first thing I have is I got here a little late, I had a flat tire, but I listened to what our state representatives had to say and our state senator. Um, I really don't plan on any help coming from the state to the city. I think that uh, the legislature is just a mess. Um, I think this, the city has some very, very hard times ahead of it. I think the worst is still in front of us. I don't know what the tax increases will be, but um, I think the council needs to realize a couple facts that are really starting to come forward, not citywide, be because, I mean, they, they hit on the 9.8% unemployment here and the high poverty levels. I guess they were kind of leading us to that. But uh, nationally, this country has the highest poverty level since Johnson's Great Society. And I think that's a very troubling thing. And I believe that um, today's the anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination, I believe. I could be wrong on that, but I thought it happened in Memphis today but in, in the 60s. Um, and you know, I think that that man had it absolutely right because uh, empowerment has to do with wages and the ability to earn money and to take money home. And I'm, and I, I, I'm really troubled by the shift that our state legislators have come here and talked about because the real problem in America, Mr. Dobson hit some of it, are the trade agreements that this country signed and the lack of employment that is in this country. There's been a massive drain of revenue from this, from this country because employers have outsourced their work. Now, there needs to be some decisions made elsewhere, but in the short term, this city needs to enact some legislation which is going to make it possible for this city to turn around. And I have a different opinion probably than most people all the time have but I've studied government all my life. Well, not all my life, since I was about 16 when Ms. I was in Mr. Festa's class and he was a really, really um, gifted history teacher, to be quite honest, and, a, and really a credit to educators. And I just think our answers are right here. We need to use the city's class 2A status and ask the legislature to allow us to become an enterprise zone, the whole city. We need to enact SAPA, even though no one wants to hear that word, because we need to fill Scranton's industrial parks with jobs, and we need to tie that to coal so that people can get to work. Look, at this isn't about Democrats and Republicans. This is about people. And I have to say that I doubt the legislature is going to come here and help us, because the, leg because the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has no money. We're in very serious trouble here. Our solutions are simple. We need jobs, we need cooperation, and we need leadership. That's what we need. But when you listen to what our legislators say to us about what's happening somewhere else, look, we need to discuss what's happening here, and we need solutions here. And we don't need them tomorrow, we need them today. In my opinion, with all due respect to this council and you, Mr. Joyce, our budget hole is huge. It's just unbelievable. And I, in my own personal opinion, if I could have a say, I'd tell the legislature to come here since they created Act 47 and they allowed the PEL to run this city. Yes, there have been problems with leadership by councils and mayors in this city for a long time. But our major problems are, in my humble opinion, the people outside the city have used the city to try to manipulate, smashing of manipul of, uh municipal unions under Act 47, and I think that when you really take a good hard look at what's happened here, it's only come to hurt Scrantonians. And then when the governor 
says, don't look to us for help, we fought their battle and we lost. And now what we need the legislature to do is to pick up something and fight some of our battle. We need to turn Scranton into an enterprise zone so we can create jobs, so that we can quite possibly, as the only class 2A city, I can't see why it can't come through the legislature. Because if Scranton becomes an enterprise zone, it has no effect anywhere else in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Andy Sprague, Citizens of Scranton, fellow Scrantonians. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, I, good evening Council. I, I usually associate Scrantonians and don't go any further. Uh, I listen to our dear legislators. And Mr. Rogan, he talked about the 1% sales tax for Lackawanna County. When that came up one time, I said, it's like taking a soup bone and throwing it out to a pack of animals, and they're going to jump for it. That's how I describe that 1%. But now on the other thing, why isn't he on board with the tax, removing the real estate tax, well, the school board portion of it, from our tax base? That would do a heck of a lot more than that 1%. And the governor's on board with it. But yet I don't think he's on board with it. Your legislature, your senator, I heard him say he has reservations. That's another word for saying I don't like it, okay? That would help out more people throughout the Commonwealth than anything else. You said he was on the DEC, was he on that? Mm -hmm. Do you remember why they pushed in Act 111? It was to prevent the firemen and the policemen from striking. Right. Now, why would you assume that Act 47 would overturn that right? If they wanted to Act 47 to overturn 111, they should have negatified 111 and let the police and firemen strike again. But they didn't do it. And I, and I heard him say he disagreed with the Supreme Court decision on that. True, he has the right to disagree, but it makes me worry about his thinking. Because anybody with common sense would realize you gave people a right so they wouldn't strike. And then you try to take it away with another act. And the Supreme Court said, no, you gave them that right, and you have to abide by it. So, so I doubt a lot of things he said. And I'm sorry to say he's our senator. There's a lot of things he may be able to do. The governor is on board with the tax for the schools. Now the governor said, I like it because it helps business. And by doing that, you wouldn't need all these other acts to help business because they wouldn't be paying the real estate tax to the school district. And all of us, of course, would have to, but they would not do it. And maybe they would come out a lot better. They probably would because we just still have to pay an uh, increase in our taxes when we buy stuff or in our wage tax or whatever it is. We would take the burden. But in turn, it would, would help more people than I think it would harm. Because we don't all, unless they put a big uh, bite on the food, then of course it would hurt everybody more than the business. But we have to look at that. But he didn't look at it. He just says, I don't think, like it. And that's not right, too, from a senator. He should really look at it in depth. I don't, I don't look at it because it's in the progress of being changed, this, that, and everywhere. But somewhere along the line, it seemed to have, they ironed out some problems with it. Now, what are they jump on board with it? I don't know. Now, you know they're doing the nonprofits down there. Mm -hmm. Now, why should nonprofits be immune from service tax? Just like I pay for firemen and policemen, They're, they use the firemen and they policemen too. If they're exempt, they should only be from real estate tax and not from city services tax. 
Now, whether they may correct it down there or not, I don't know. Maybe you should all write a letter to all the legislatures, like the mayor did when he went out to sell the south side, south, south side complex. He went out there and they lobbied. Of course, I don't expect you to go lobby. Well, actually, they hired a, li a lobbying firm. Um, was it Wolf Block or something like that? No, I remember that. But the city hired an actual lobbyist to work on the state legislators so that they would be able to sell the South Side Complex. And that's what, I, that's what actually happened. Our yeah. money was used against us. I know that. But like I said, maybe you should lobby it, not by letter writing, rather than hiring a lobby like he did. But these are things that you should do, regardless of what they do, because really you ain't going to expect too much help from them. Oh, no, I, I agree with you, Mr. Spiraglia. Um, I did appreciate the participation of uh, Senator Blake and Representative Haggerty and uh, Mr. Welby, but um, and and I did learn much from tonight's discussion. But I didn't receive answers, direct answers to questions that I posed. And I noted that none of the three um, provided a commitment to any legislation. None agreed, yes, I will do this. Good evening, Council. Marie Schumacher, city resident and taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Mrs. Craig for the answer she provided uh, from two weeks ago on the um, what civil crossroads consulting and engineering is going to do for us for the ten thousand dollars. We'll be or up to ten thousand dollars. We'll be paying for them. The next, I'd like to read two paragraphs from. Uh, Scranton Times Tribune uh, papers within the last week. The first is from last Saturday. A search of the halfway home Mr. Gonzales was staying in at 1512 Olive Street, Scranton, revealed 555 bags of heroin and nearly 36 grams of cocaine, police said. The next one is from this past Monday, it says, Sean Boldine, 37, 537, 539 Linden Street, was selling heroin as J-Rock while living at a halfway house in Scranton until two controlled purchases at two locations Monday around noon, police said. Um, you know, you can't hardly pick up the paper these days without drug dealers being busted, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But... I know there is no ordinance specifically addressing halfway houses, and I wonder, um, Mr. Rogan, I believe you work pretty closely with Mr. McGough. Will that be revealed? Uh, will halfway houses be revealed via the rental registration program? Sure, I'll, I'll speak with Mr. McGough on that, and I definitely think it should. It should be. Um, and and one one exemption that I know was in there that. I brought up was a concern that, that I had was hotels were exempt and my concern was that for instance the Hotel Sun was yes. a, a building okay. like that and, and there's a lot of amendments that need to be made. We, the first one's been made um, and we need to keep working to make that law better. Okay, uh, I really think that it needs to be addressed that uh, these halfway houses should have some adult supervision. That, Absolutely. Uh, something needs to be done. Uh, but the other component is, uh, while I continue to read about these large, uh, large dealers being shut down, the thing that I don't ever see in the paper is a drug customer, a drug dealer's customer being arrested. Uh, Mr. Loscombe, do you know anything about how many drug users have been, uh, have been arrested over the past, even just 12 months? I could get that information for you, but I don't have a specific. Yeah, it, it seems amount. to me that the drug dealers wouldn't be here at all if we didn't have a market, and uh, it's, it's about as scary 
wondering who are all these users that we're interfacing with on a regular basis, as it is wondering who that police officer was that, uh, that was busted for doing something and demoted. Um, you just can't have any confidence in any, um, any transactions when you don't know who's on which side of the fence. Uh, the next, um, the next issue. So I, I would appreciate that. Sure. Uh, the next issue is why is file of council 100 of 2009, uh, 2009 still on the table? As I recall, that just deals with where the parking meters are placed within the city, and I don't know why that is dependent on any other piece of legislation. Is that, will that, why is it still on the table, and when will it be brought back? I, I don't know. Um, I think everything should receive an up or down vote at some point, though. And, and I say, Mr. Joyce, you were going to investigate on that, too, to see if there's some kind of study that was done that says where these should be placed, or is it just as haphazard as taking this block and that block and exempting block Y and taxing? Our I'm still looking for the answer to that. Okay. But, I mean, I think that's of interest to a lot of people, and I hope you will um, follow through and have a public hearing on that when it does, when you do decide what's going to be in that revised file of council. Um, I did notice that last Saturday there were, the legal notices contained a, an RFP for the new parking meter management, but did anybody read that? The uh, the RFP. Okay, I, I, n my concern is that you the the meters that were to be purchased by Standard Parking were meters that you all didn't want. You wanted ones that went back to zero, and I assume those orders had have not been placed because they don't have the their five year contract. Um, and maybe won't. Maybe somebody else will underbid them when the, the bids are open on April 12th. But um, will that? I would like to know if that will be a separate separate RFP that's yet to come. Yes, there'll be a study for 90 days after the contract is awarded to determine what type of upgrades will be done. That's that's taken out of this contract. This is only the management. I, okay. Then there's going to be a separate, and it states specifically in there. Okay, you haven't seen it. Thank you. Yeah. You know. The, you know yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's um, totally different than the original one. <laughs> you know, I, the, I would the, it was already pre-selected as to what type of meter it was going to be. Um, I reviewed that. I had 13 comments that ended up being all incorporated into the RFP, okay. one of which was that and what was to be included. There's even technology now, instead of using a credit card, where there's an app for a cell phone. Yeah, I know. And you but can do that. I mean, there, there's so much technology that is beyond what was going to be previously bid. That's yeah. all going to be looked into. Okay. I, with that, I would just caution, though, that people can, can lift that, your, your charge card when you do it on the, the cell phone that they I wouldn't know how to do it. I, I'm a quarter guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the bell has rung, but next week I'll be back to talk about the uh, delinquent o OECD loans. Um, and maybe if I could, if you'd indulge me for just a minute, I'll, I'll just read the, the status of the loan, loan portfolio right now. Uh, commercial, industrial, there are 24 active loans, 13 of which are in default, which is over half. UDAG, there are five active, three of them are in default. Uh, CDBG, there are 10 and six are in default. Enterprise zone loans, five active and three in default. Economic development uh, EDA program, there are three in the population and two of the three are in default. So I will have some more figures on that next week unless something else motivates me more than that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Hi, Chris. Hey, Chris is back to the podium. Chris is back to the podium. Yeah, that's your trick. 
Well, Jack, the team's in this year. New team this year, Jack, up to the Red Riders. Guys, good luck. Tony. Have a good one tonight. Good luck. Good luck. You're right, Chris. Right, good luck. Mrs. Craig? 5A motions. Councilman Rogan, do you have any comments or motions tonight? Yes, um, I'll be very brief tonight. Just uh, want to talk a little more about the caucus with the state representatives and the state senator and uh, to reiterate my position um, against Senator Blake's additional sales tax. Um, I did speak on this issue um, during the recovery plan process and um, in previous. My concern with, with the senator's proposal is that what it would be would be an additional tax instead of a change in the tax structure or tax reform. Um, I know the senator's proposal could bring revenue into the city coffers, but it would just be an additional tax on the folks in the county and the city. By switching to a sales tax system or a hybrid between sales tax and other taxes to fund education, that would reduce or preferably completely eliminate school property taxes. And if the, school, if the school district portion of property taxes were eliminated throughout the state, when cities and boroughs fall on tough times, if their taxes go up, it wouldn't hurt people as much as when you have three taxing bodies raising property taxes within a couple year period. Um, as Mrs. Evans mentioned, the county's tax increases have crippled the people of the county. The, the city's taxes are hurting people. The school taxes are hurting people. And there needs to be a change in how the taxes are paid. Um, the senior citizens and working people can't keep footing all the bill in the, um, you know, to keep cities, school districts, and counties afloat. Um, by switching to a sales tax system, most of your basic purchases are tax exempt. So the person who is living on a, a smaller income, um, who is buying food, medicine, shelter, those items you don't pay sales tax on. When you go to Rite Aid to purchase your prescriptions, you don't pay a sales tax. Um, if you go to the grocery store, unless you're buying prepared foods, um, you won't be paying a sales tax. And, and those items, I, I firmly believe, must remain tax exempt. That's one of the advantages that Pennsylvania does have over other states. I know the crossings outlets are very popular with people from New York because they come, because in New York, clothes are taxed. So those folks will come into Pennsylvania to buy their clothes tax free. And that's part of my fear with if Lackawanna County imposed a 1% tax and, for instance, Luzerne, Wyoming, and surrounding counties didn't um, for big ticket purchases. Um, people would certainly cross the county boundaries to, to make those purchases. And um, I know, and I mentioned it to the senator, that they did put a provision in there that you would still have to pay, but that would be just like the, um, you know, when, when you would buy something on Amazon.com before the tax was at the point of sale, you were technically required to pay that tax at the end of the year, but people didn't know about it and it, it wasn't enforced for the most part. So I hope that we will continue to meet with our legislators um, hopefully the mayor, um, the current mayor and the new mayor um, will get involved where we could sit down on a, at least a, a monthly or a quarterly basis. And, and like I said, we could rotate. Obviously, if, if council's involved, only two of us could go at a time. But there's, there's three rep, two representatives and a senator. So if, for instance, two of us met with Representative Flynn, two with Representative Haggerty, and, and one with uh, Senator Blake and, and, and mixed it up, we could accomplish uh, a lot by having those meetings on a a very regular basis. Um, just a couple things that were mentioned. Ms. Schumacher brought up the halfway houses, and that is a very good point. Um, that it is a problem that needs to be addressed um, throughout the city. Halfway houses and rooming houses are a problem in the city. They need inspections. They need to be um, checked up on more than the average single-family home or duplex throughout the city when you have people that have in many cases had a history of committing crimes. Um, these people need a lot more supervision than, than law-abiding citizens uh, throughout the community. And um, the drug problem in the community, I agree that 
it needs to be addressed on both the supply and the demand end. And um, I, I will bring that up next time I see Chief Graziano. I'm, I actually have to call him on a couple other issues, so I'll, I'll bring that, that up as well. And um, that is all I have for tonight. Up, oh, actually, two citizens' requests. Um, and Mrs. Craig, I will email these in. Um, one is actually a school district issue. Um, residents from Trip, the Trip Park area uh, brought to my attention that there are two um, retention ponds near the school that last year um, there was a large, there was a problem with frogs around spring where there were hundreds and hundreds of frogs. <laughs> <laughs> First I've heard of it, but a lot of frogs in these ponds that were going into the neighborhood, running across the street, and it was a nuisance. So if we could let Mr. King and the, and the directors at the school district know about that issue. And also... I hope they're not going to call the animal control. I know. <laughs> well, I'm thinking now... Should be taken to Griffin. Right? <laughs> We're going all about $100,000 for the frogs. Well, I figure right now because, well, it is spring, but it doesn't feel like spring out. Maybe there may be a chemical or something that could be placed in the water to deter um, the tadpoles from you know, from, from procreating in, in the pool. And um, also, Mr. Joyce brought up the issue of a, of a blighted property that was on the list to be demolished, and then there was an issue of sale. Um, I spoke to probably the same resident that you did um, on that issue, and I did speak to Mr. Seitzinger and, and Ms. Abley about it. Um, Mark Seitzinger did get back to me very quick. He said he's, he's still looking into it, so hopefully we'll have an, a firm answer on that. And... Um, there were one or two others actually left in my car, but I'll be sure I email those in. And uh, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Loscombe, do you have comments or motions this evening? Yes, thank you. Just briefly, I would like to, uh, again, reiterate my thanks to our representatives, and, and I'm looking forward to continued dialogue between us and, and those bodies. Uh, it's definitely, definitely needed, and uh, we have to stay on them. Like they say, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and uh, I understand as Mrs. Evans kept implicating that we're concerned with our area right now. We do realize that there are situations across the state, um, and perhaps some of those other areas, uh, you know, we can work with too, with our representatives to to get a, you know, a more combined effort to get some of these problems resolved, but. Uh, but we are on the right step, and uh, we just have to stay, keep our pedal to the metal. I, I agree, and I'm sorry to, no, to jump fine. in, but just very, very quickly. I know that um, Senator Blake holds a legislative breakfast every few months to which everyone is invited. So, you know, there's been access to him uh, in that manner, but beyond that, uh, I know I have met with, with him and state representatives many times in the last four years. Uh, at times I know Councilman Joyce has met with I'm him. With him once, yeah. I know that uh, you were frequently in communication with former Representative Murphy's office over, yes. you know, a myriad of problems in the city and I think... Um, Councilman Rogan was as well. So I, you know, I don't want the public to misunderstand that tonight was the first time there was any meeting of this sort. That's, That's not accurate. Yes. Um, there have been public meetings, public caucuses previously, but in addition to that, there have been regular meetings held with um, state legislators in council's office. And, you know, I, although um, we learn a great deal and I like to consider them productive, I have to say that not once, and I'll include tonight's discussion in this, not once did I ever receive a commitment from them that they were going to absolutely draft this legislation, absolutely pursue, you know, this, what, whatever the the topic might be in order to fight for the people, in order to fight for our city. I, I can't seem to be able to pin them down to any commitments whatsoever. They, they do share our concerns, I'm sure, for the people, 
Uh, but again, as you said, our interest lies here within the city of Scranton, and Scranton is the child that's in critical condition. And everyone needs to be addressing that child, everyone who represents that child. And I, you know, I, I think we, we have many, many discussions, but not nearly, not nearly enough action. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I, I agree with that totally. And, and uh, I think possibly due to the fact that uh, our two representatives are freshmen, you know, they may be a little bit leery on committing to something at this point, and, and hopefully they will, uh, you know, heed our words and our advice and, and take the bull by the horns. And, and, and uh, you know, they do seem interested, like you said. So I hope it's just, uh, you know, the, the freshmen in them that kept them from making a commitment at this point because, uh, you know, uh, politicians have made commitments before and weren't able to follow up on them. And, Mm -hmm. And it came back and bit them. So I would just hope that, uh, you know, in a few months we're sitting here and they already have legislation that's going to benefit us. And so that, that's the way I take it at this point. So hopefully it'll work out that way. And just the, the last thing, I just want to read a, uh, it, it's more of a, a public service announcement. Um, as you're aware, this, this regards to the fire department uh, smoke detector program. As you are aware, we are continuing our very successful smoke alarm installation program. We have recently received a new shipment of alarms and would like to make the public aware that they are available. There is no charge for the smoke alarms and city firefighters will install them for free. The alarms were made available by WNEP TV's Save a Life program and a successful grant written by the fire department. The only restrictions to this grant are as follows. The alarms must be installed by fire department personnel. I know there have been people requesting, you know, drop off three alarms and, and, and stuff. They have to be done by the fire department for, for liability purposes, and, and they're experienced into where the best locations are uh, to put the smoke detectors, because there are dead spaces where you, if you stuck a detector, it would be ineffective anyway. So it, it is very, and, and they've put up I did have the list, and I'll, I'll I, forgive me, I'll try and get it for next meeting, the hundreds of alarms that they've already installed so far. So it is a great public service, and they're out there every day putting them in the houses for you. So take advantage of it if you need it. The second restriction is that landlords or commercial building owners do not qualify to receive the alarms. However, the tenants do qualify. So if you're living in an apartment building, an apartment house, and you feel you're inadequately served by fire protection, don't hesitate to call and, and request a smoke detector. And to receive the alarms, the city residents simply need to call a fire prevention officer, Sean Flynn, at 348-4164 and hit option one to set up an appointment for the installation. And uh, this letter was written respectfully by Dave Gervasi, Administrative Captain, on behalf of Al Lucas, uh, our Deputy Chief on the Fire Department. So please, folks, take advantage of this program. Um, you know, it only, it'll only take a short while for the firefighters to install these in your property, but you'll be able to sleep safe at night, and uh, the last thing they want to do is, is have a tragedy where someone didn't make it out, and it's not costing you anything. So, again, call Sean Flynn's number at 348-4164 and press option one, and uh, then you can leave your information and they'll set up an appointment when it's convenient for you to have them stop by. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Councilman Joyce, do you have comments or motions tonight? Yes. As we all know, it's very important that the audit uh, this year is completed in a timely fashion. We've received correspondence from Rossi and Rossi that the city is to complete 32 different tasks before the audit can be issued and an exit conference can be held. I won't name off each task that needs to be completed at this time, however, in Rossi and Rossi's initial correspondence to the business administrator, there was a timeline that was specified that must be adhered to in order to complete the audit in a timely manner. Some of these tasks 
were due to be completed on March 31st. With this in mind, Mrs. Craig, please send a request to our BA, Ryan McGowan, asking him to specify what tasks were completed by March 31st. Typically, the business administrator's office also submits a cash flow report to, state, to the state and city council's office on a periodic basis, outlining revenue and expenditure categories for each month. To this date, we have not received any such reports for the year of 2013. I'm interested in seeing what revenue categories are underperforming and overperforming, as well as how the city is performing in regard to expenditures. Also with this in mind, Mrs. Craig, please add this to the list of items to contact Ryan McGowan about. And I do have some requests. Several West Granton residents have voiced their concern to me about speeding on Sloan Street as well as altering vehicle traffic. Residents, especially those with small children, fear that the reckless driving on the street will result in an accident. Residents also have concerns that ATV traffic is illegal and should be stopped. Mrs. Craig, please forward this information to Chief Graziano and ask that he send a patrolman to this area to monitor the situation. Several West Granton residents living on Rundle Street have voiced their concerns about Albert Place, which is currently, uh, well, which is currently the court directly behind Rundle Street. There are various potholes located in this court in the 1100, 1200, 1300, and 1400 blocks. The potholes that are contained throughout the court are making travel conditions very difficult for residents. Mrs. Craig, please forward this request to Director Dewar and ask him to handle in the best way that he sees fit. A portion of this court may be in Taylor since it's close uh, in proximity to the Taylor Scranton border. If, part of, uh, if it is part of Taylor, please instruct Director Dewar to contact the Taylor DPW for patching. West Granton residents have voiced their concerns about potholes located on the lower portion of West Elm Street where West Elm and Meridian Avenue meet. Potholes are making travel conditions difficult and residents are becoming very frustrated. Mrs. Craig, please add this to the list of issues to contact Director Dewar about. Also, various South Scranton residents have voiced their concern to me about possible suspicious activity taking place on the 1500 block of Prospect Avenue. Residents have concerns that they have witnessed possible drug deals and that the block is becoming a haven for crime. Mrs. Craig, please add this to the list of issues to contact Chief Graziano about, and that's all for tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Recently, I received inquiries from city residents regarding the 2013 garbage fee. The bills should be mailed out next week, and the deadline for the first payment will be extended to May 31, 2013, while the deadline for the second and final payment will remain the same as in previous years, July 31. I discussed the need for increased revenue sources during um, March 2013 Council meeting. And one of the solutions offered by the Doherty administration and included in the 2013 budget was increased fees for false alarms. Between January and mid-March of this year, four false alarms were documented by the fire department at the University of Scranton. However, during that same time period, it seems that the Scranton Fire Department was called to respond to firearms at the university on 15 occasions for the following reasons. In the month of January, seven calls including activation of the automatic fire alarm system caused by making toast, students set off alarm by cooking, alarm accidentally tripped by cooking, report of burnt food, full station activation by persons unknown, several individuals stuck in elevator which was stalled between floors. Firefighters gained access to the car from the floor above and removed 11 students via the emergency hatch located on top of car. 
no injuries or damage. And two days later, again, 12 people stuck in elevator. In February, three alarms, including cooking set off alarm, alarm accidentally tripped, and five students extricated from elevator through the ceiling hatch of the elevator. March 1st to 17th, uh, or excuse me, to the 9th, five alarms, including a call canceled en route, activation of fire alarm system, hallway detector for unknown reasons, burn popcorn, cooking set off fire alarm, and uh, finally then on March 9th, parade day, there were additional nuisance calls. Certainly, like most of my colleagues and all of you, I'm not qualified to determine which calls constitute a false alarm and require payment of fees and which do not. However, fuel costs and wear and tear on vehicles and equipment incurred when responding to nuisance calls such as burned popcorn, a beeping smoke alarm, and charred toast merit consideration even as the city continues to be a good and faithful neighbor. More importantly, some must count themselves fortunate that true fire emergencies have not occurred at the same time firefighters responded to nuisance calls. We are grateful to the Scranton Fire Department for keeping the university's students safe during any and all circumstances for which they are called out to duty. And we hope that the good fortune of other areas of our city will continue as our fire department responds to the needs of our colleges and universities. Next, Chief Graziano contacted Mrs. Craik in Council's office this week to respond to our concerns regarding handicapped parking. The Chief indicated that all locations on North Hyde Park Avenue, was that? Yes, the 300 of North Hyde okay. Park that all locations on that block were uh, checked and only one among them had unnecessary signage. The handicapped sign was removed and returned to the DPW. Also, Chief Graziano stated that he's in the process of developing a possible handicapped parking program which would require annual registration with the Scranton Police Department. And in that way, they would be able to Get recycle return, the yeah. signs as you suggested. Further, we learned recently that there's a very lengthy waiting list for handicapped signs, which should not occur. Since the elimination of the Traffic Maintenance Department, the DPW no longer produces signs as once it did. At the same time, it appears the DPW has not ordered handicapped signs to address the needs of those individuals who have been waiting for quite a while on that list. Therefore, Mrs. Craig, please send letters to the mayor and DPW director requesting the purchase of handicapped signs. Should the DPW budget not allow for this purchase, city council, will provide funding from the UDAG RERI account. Provide a response on or before April 15th in order that council may take action promptly if necessary. And then finally, I have citizens request for the week. Please include the 1500 block of Von Storch Avenue on the 2013 paving list. If for any reason the block cannot be paved this year, please fill all potholes. Residents report that this street hasn't been paved in decades. Also, repair holes in the 1300 block of St. Anne Street. And that's it. 5B, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to disperse $20,000 from the account into which repayment of Urban Development Action Grants, UDAG, are deposited, UDAG repayment account, for an operating grant to ECTV, the city's PEG channel operator. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Um, I don't believe unless... Um,
Councilman Joyce uh, would know additional information that any funding was provided in the 2013 operating budget for ECTV. I don't believe there was. And uh, last year, I believe we uh, provided $10,000. Uh, I've learned that the school district makes no contribution, no financial contribution to ECTV, although uh, they have full use of one of our two PEG channels. That would be channel 21. And I believe the county commissioners uh, contribute $25,000 annually on behalf of the county. I did speak with the mayor about this issue. Uh, he was in agreement. And uh, in addition to that, there has been work on the part of the administration on um, revisiting the Comcast contract that was tabled uh, probably at least two years ago. And from what I'm hearing, uh, both sides are getting uh, very close to settling that contract. And of course, it will provide funding to the, be the PEG channel operator, that is to uh, ECTV, uh, not only this year, but in forthcoming years as well. However, I don't know, I can't put a timeline on the um, uh, successful uh, conclusion of that contract. And we felt that it was important that ECTV would have funds to be able to continue operating. <laughs> and so uh, I will be voting to approve this tonight. Is there anyone on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6A, reading by title, file of council number 15, 2013, an ordinance authorizing excavations on the 200 block of Penn Avenue and 300 block of Linden Street to permit motor vehicle ingress, egress, and regress into a parking lot at the corner of Penn Avenue and Linden Street for NGP Enterprises, LLC. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. On the question? Um, I know that uh, we've received, each of us on council, uh, information from attorney um, Pascal. Pascal. And uh, in order that he can provide this information to the public as well, I've asked that he might come in next week for a public caucus beginning at 530. And at that time, the parking lot and its uses, which I believe are for his employees and his clients, uh, will be discussed, as well as the potential meter removal. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6B, reading by title. File of Council Number 16, 2013, an ordinance authorizing the removal of parking meters on Penn <coughs> Avenue, 200 block, and Linden Street, 300 block, in the city of Scranton to provide an ingress and egress from Penn Avenue and Linden Street to a parking lot for NGP Enterprises, LLC. You've heard reading by title of item 6B. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6B pass reading by title. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Seventh order 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Rules for adoption, file of council number 13, 2013, amending file of council number 17, 2012, as amended, entitled, Establishing a Registration Program for Residential Rental Properties, requiring all owners of residential rental properties to designate an agent for service of process and prescribing duties of owners, agents, and occupants, directing the designation of agents, establishing fees for the costs associated with the registration of rental property, 
and prescribing penalties for violations by amending Section 1X, Safety Inspection, by deleting, deleting the phrase, but it's not limited to. As Chair for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of Item 7A. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscombe? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare Item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. And I think we can all say that one was for you, Bob McGough. <laughs> <laughs> and Mrs. Craig? 7B, for consideration by the Committee on Rules for adoption, file of council number 14, 2013, as amended, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to execute a deed conveying pedestrian bridge column easements located in the public right-of-way <coughs> in the 300 block of Colfax Avenue and conveying an aerial easement in the airspace located on the 300 block of Colfax Avenue where the pedestrian bridge is erected and further to execute an air rights agreement between Geisinger Community Medical Center and the City of Scranton. As Chair for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of Item 7B. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscombe? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare Item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. If there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>